Hello there and a very warm welcome to From the Corner, where we learn the inside tricks of the trade from the trainers. I'm delighted to say that, as usual, I have a very illustrious bunch of people here around the table with me this afternoon. First of all, very warm welcome to Eddie Lamb from the iBox Gym down in Bromley. Good to see you, Eddie. Thanks for joining us. Very all the way from Philadelphia, USA, Brian Cohen, one of the managers uh, who's really got his finger on the pulse as far as women's boxing is concerned right now. Brian, good to have you with good us. Good to be here. Sean O'Hagan, of course, who is looking after, well, of course, Josh Warrington and Maxie Hughes this weekend. Uh, You've come a long, long way as well, haven't you, from just down the road? Yeah, about, <laughs> uh, about five minutes away. Yeah. Thanks so for joining us, Sean. And, and Andy. he still looks a million dollars. Anthony Kroller, my <laughs> old friend, former world champion, of course, but now very much a trainer in his own right. Good to have you with us, Thanks Anthony. for having us, mate. Good to be with uh, I'll start with you. I mean, the, the transition from fighter to trainer, was it always a, a fairly simple transition for yeah. you? Was it one that always was in the back of your mind? I wouldn't, yeah, I'd say, I wouldn't say it was simple, but it was something that was always in the back of my mind. I think even when I was a professional, I was fighting in world title fights, I was still helping out with the amateur kids and stuff like that. But the plan was always to just stay with the amateurs for a bit and in time, maybe dabble in professionals obviously helped Joe out and stuff like that but like that was that was the plan and then he ended up helping one lad out and then I think I just said off there now I didn't plan on having any now I've got six uh, seven now thinking about it and I'm in and yeah I, um, I'm not getting out anytime soon it's one of those things once you're in it's it's, it's like the old saying of the yeah. godfather in you know, they try try yeah. and pull me back in time yes. and time again um Eddie, for you, um, you had a, an amateur career as a, as a fighter, didn't yeah. you? But you made the decision that, that turning pro wasn't for you. Yeah, I had 56 amateur fights, all senior fights, but I started a little bit late. I started uh, 15, I never had my first fight till I was 17, so I was chucked in right at the deep end. But um, yeah, I've always stuck, um, after I finished, I've always uh, um, stayed in boxing, running out, helping out amateur clubs here and there. And uh, I've been with uh, Al Smith now down at the Art Box for uh, 12 years. And you said that um, as far as a, a, an amateur was concerned, you took a few too many shots, is that right? Yeah, I'm glad I didn't turn pro. My coach <laughs> kind of never wanted me to um, turn pro, and, and I always wondered why. But um, <laughs> back now, I'll, yeah, he, you know, he just wanted, um, he's looking after my welfare. Brian, as far as you're concerned, you, yeah. you did have a, a pretty good uh, pro career, didn't you? I did. I was 15 and 2 with 14 knockouts. I, I didn't reach your heights, but I had a WBC continental belt yeah. uh, at 175, believe it or not. And wow. you know, I'm, yeah, I know yeah. I'm five foot nothing. So, <laughs> you know, it was, it was, it was rough fighting the big guys, but yeah. And as far as, as moving on from there, you've been a cup man, you've been a trainer, you've been a promoter, a manager, you've done the whole lot. <laughs> Jack of all trades, master of none. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was, you know, uh, boxing was always in my family. My father managed fighters, he had a gym. So I was always around boxing. And, Kind of all I know. Sean, a little bit different as far as your sort of training career is concerned. You have a, a little bit of a, a background in the amateurs, but it was largely sort of built around what Josh was doing as a kid, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really. It was more of um, I doubled here and there, decided I wasn't good enough. Didn't like the idea of getting filled in on a regular basis. <laughs> so I thought I'll jump on the training side of things. So we've we'll jumped on the training side of things, but we've we'll grown together with that. Um, and again, you can't help getting sucked in, can you, with boxing? So how did you learn then? I mean, obviously, people like Anthony and people like Brian and, and Eddie, if, if they, you guys have been regularly around established professional coaches, but if you're sort of maybe seeing a few people here and there on the amateur scene, how do you actually go about learning the trick? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, same as anything else, we all start somewhere, even your world champion fighters start as amateurs. And I don't think that's any different for a coach, really. I think what is different is how much you're willing to put into it how much you're willing to take other people's advice and um, how much you're willing to do your research. Um, everybody gets good at what they're doing by research and development, don't they? Being now people with more experience, never being scared to pick the phone up and ask for advice, you know, uh, and study <coughs> other trainers. So I think that's where I've got my little bit from. Um, apart from that, I was a doorman. And, uh, what I had to learn very quickly when I had to get chinned every Friday or Saturday <laughs> night. And we work in middle of Leeds, or we used to do. So that's my experience. That was my, uh, my bit of input there with boxing. Is that where you developed the, the, the fight or flight response? Well, I'm not built for running. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm not you built for running, but I can move from waist and I can move my head. So yeah, it was more of a no big massive experience there. But you grow, don't you? I mean, you were saying now Josh into his 13th year. Um, I started a little bit earlier than Josh with amateurs and just progressed, you know, put me researching, listened to advice of other people, more experience than myself. And um, there we are with Maxi Hughes, Josh, Ray Small coming through and a couple of other young prospects. So yeah, that was my, uh, that was my introduction to boxing. Brian, what about you? Where, where did the transition come as far as you were concerned? So, when, when, oh God, when I was a kid, my father had a boxing gym. So I always used to sit around in the gym and I used to listen to a lot of the older trainers. Um, you know, Philadelphia is an interesting town. It's a fighting town, you know, especially back in more or less the 80s and 90s. And, and then I just always remember uh, I was a little kid and, and I had a little bike with no, no pedals on it. I remember sitting on the, um, the fighters' feet so they could do sit-ups. I mean, I was just always in boxing. So um, when I knew I was about to be retire, which, which was when my daughter was going to be born, because I was like, I was the guy that had to be in the gym six, seven days a week. I had to be. Otherwise, psychologically, I wasn't doing enough. You, you know, and, and as a fighter, if you're not there psychologically, if you, and, you're, and if you don't think you're doing enough, it's going to mentally, oh, I should have ran that extra mile. I should have been in the gym that extra day. I, I, uh, I, I just transitioned right into training and managing. As, as, as soon as I think my daughter's mother got pregnant, to be honest with you. <laughs> you know, I had one more fight in New Zealand, which, New Zealand, which ended in a no contest. And after that, I was fine with walking away because I can live vicariously through the fighters. Uh, winning titles through them. I know I had something to do with that. In, in, be it managing or training. So I'm very content where I'm at. Does that ring true with you, Eddie? Because like you said, when, when you got to the end of your amateur career, you had Alan Smith there, obviously, who's, who's a great mentor to have. But was it a, simply a case of, well, I love the sport too much. I don't want to leave it completely. I've got all this, this energy and all this time to give. So that's, that's the route that I want to go down. Yeah, um, I, I used to run like little cute feet, at, um, do like boxer size sessions and then I, I um, I helped open up an amateur boxing club and I just dabbled in it. I was just uh, messing around. But um, Al asked me if 12 years ago he had Sam Webb, who was British champion. Yeah. Uh, Bradley Skeet was just about to turn pro, along with Louis Petit. And then um, he asked me if I wanted to would I come and help him out. And I had a little think about it. I had a talk with my missus and she said, Look, you always wanted to turn pro as a fighter. Why don't you do it as a trainer? <clears throat> You know, why not? And I miss, I'm still now uh, just, I started off just helping out just for a little bit of fun, seeing myself on TV a couple of times a week, going to the gym. And then it was three times, four times, and before you know it, now I'm down there seven days a week, just like, you don't look for boxing, look for boxing, find you. Is it almost addictive, would you say? Yeah. Being part of this know, sport? It, I, I, I guess so, yeah. I guess so. You know, boxing finds you. I've mean, certainly found you. I mean, in terms of what you were going to do when, once you'd retired from fighting, obviously we see a lot of fighters that just go completely in the opposite direction. But but was that always something that you were thinking that I've, I've still got that energy, I've still got that love? Because you just yeah. absolutely loved it, didn't you? Yeah, I, uh, I'm obsessed with the sport. And at times, like, the, one of the, the sides of it that you hate and you can't stand, but mm. I believe there's a lot more highs than lows, you know, in the sport. And obviously when people always ask me to go, do you know, do you ever get, do you, know, do you miss it? I don't miss it at all as a fighter because I'm around it all the time still and I'm helping coach fighters to, you know, get the best out of themselves. Like, literally, as soon as we've finished here, bang, I'm straight down the motorway to train the fighters. But it's, um, I think, like Eddie said, I think, like all the boys have said, it, it, it's, an, um, it's an addiction. It's an, and I think you've got to be addicted in some kind of way. Like, yeah. so don't get me yeah. wrong, Dad. In my head, I think, Ah, I'll just stay here now, sit around with the lads, yeah. maybe have a drink or two, talk some more. But then I think, if it did, then the guilt I'd have through, you know, letting one of the fighters down. Because I think, my old coach would always say, you know, they've got to want it as bad as you. And I believe the fighters that I've got to do so, I can't let them down. Do you know what I mean? I can't let and them down. And are you content being down it now? Yeah. Just in this capacity? Yes, totally, Sean. Yeah. Honestly, Sean. And I get it, and I still get the buzz for it. And I'm not just saying it because yeah. you sat next to me like, I was looking forward to the fight, but then when I've seen how well Josh looks, and I'm like, no, Saturday, he's going to go out and do it. Because I've knew Josh a long time, and I'm like, he's going to go out there Saturday night, and he's going to do it. I'm really confident he's going to. It's an easy fight whatsoever, but 
I believe he's going to do it. And that, I, get, I get a buzz through that still because I knew for a long time with the boxing, I knew when it was time for me to walk away. I knew that's something you've got to deal with because I knew that's a lot that. So a lot of fighters struggle with it. Do you know what I mean? Mm, Letting yeah. that, because you're never going to get those highs again you got as a fighter. But I think it's certainly close. Like, mm. I've, I dream of being, do you know what I mean? My, my aim is to be where these three guys have been. You know, I've world champions, been in the corners of world champions. I've been passing up. But like fighters who were brought for myself, I remember a few months back, I had a lad on in an eight rounder and a bit of a 50 50 fight. He won, carried out like the game plan to perfection, and the buzzer got off. That was huge. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I, I believe there's, there's going to be a lot of highs in this sport still, but there's also lows as well that like you've got to deal with. That. I always say about boxing, I'm probably going a little bit off track here, but the highs are so high and the lows. Oh, they're horrible. I remember when we were speaking oh, that night, oh, that night, oh, and, oh, no. and oh, you said to me, I will tell you the story, and I'm sure Joe won't mind, will he? Joe won't mind, so, I appreciate it. Joe, if you're watching, we're sorry in advance. Yeah. You know what, a lot of people knock Joe, but I've got to be honest and say, I don't mind him, I find him quite funny. And don't forget, I'm sat here, a relative novice in trainers terms, if you like. And I'll pick everybody's brains. And I've learned little bits going down to Joe's there. I could always come away with something. Well, who's ever gym I find myself in, I always come away with a little bit of something and I put it away for later. You know. Now, as Anthony was saying there, the eyes, you can't beat it, can you? It's like a drug. Yeah, no, I totally. the lows. I've had one bad night at work, and you know which night I'm going to refer to. Yeah. So, um, what I'll say is this, I mean, it was Reece Smolden, Josh. He's in a British title, Josh in his world title fight. Both on the same night. My worst nightmare. Reece Small goes down at fourth, it stops in ninth. Josh goes down at fourth, it stops in ninth. I didn't like to come down from drugs and drink. People were like, oh, no, what do I do here? What do I do? I'm sat all day after with my head in my hands. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> and my phone went, <laughs> and I answered me for hello. <laughs> and it was Joe, Gallagher. And Joe can be quite animated, can't he, at times? He can get a little bit excited. <laughs> now, do you know something? As low as I was feeling, listen, don't worry about it, because the woman you get flavour at mum, you top up world, you're best at it world. Next day, you have a loss, you're a wanker. <laughs> <laughs> and it, kept, it was going on and on and on, and I kept thinking, he's right. And I wanted to put phone now because I didn't want to speak to anybody. Anybody at all, not even my mother, I know. And I couldn't put phone down. I was listening to him and what he was saying made sense. You know what I mean? And I just thought, you know what, you're right. And I finished up when I finally did. He says, anyway, anyway, mate, when he finished this big long, you know, give me a list of emotions that I was going through and he was dead, right? So I know he's experienced that. But I came off at phone knowing that you know what, he's 100% right there. And I think that stopped me going into a depression for the next two weeks or something, you know what I mean? And I put phone down and I finished up laughing. And they said, I saw Anthony, we were still laughing about it. And I said, do you know what, Joe rang me. Joe rang me, bless him. I said, and he, uh, I told Anthony what he'd said and I went through the entire thing. I won't say it all there now, it's a little bit. But we couldn't stop laughing, I'm still laughing about it today. <laughs> You know what I mean? But he was dead right, would you? He was dead right, everything he said was right. I thought, yeah, he says, you'll go through. Oh my God, how did that happen? Then it'll be, oh no, that's it. What am I going to do? Can he or am I good enough to say? And he basically said, fuck all them. Don't worry about them. He said, because you'll come again and you'll listen and other. And he was dead right. He was dead right. So, you know. Does that ring true with you, Brian? Have, have you had times where you saw... So, Brian, not that I saw Brian's yeah, yeah. eyes there as we were speaking. You, you we're obviously, going... Have you had times where you thought, what the hell am I doing? Oh, this man, goodness gracious. I remember being in China, and uh, oh, it was the worst trip I've ever had in my life in China. Uh, my fighter won. It was just the entire trip was terrible. But to your point, like when your fighters lose, you, you lose. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, totally. uh, when the fighters win, you win, you know? Um, Again, like I was saying, you live vicariously through the fighter. So yeah. if you see your fighter get knocked out, shit, you know what I mean? Like, it hurts. Yeah. You know, it, it, it really hurts because they have a kid at home, a wife, a mother, or whatever. Right. So you always think of that. I'm not like one of these guys who would just throw fighters in for the payday. I can't do that. No. 
You know what I mean? Especially, I manage a lot of females. You know what I mean? So I'm a little bit more hypersensitive to the females just because they could be a mother. They, they're obviously a, a daughter to somebody. So I, yeah, to, to your point, what you're saying, man, when they lose and it's a bad loss, it hurts. It really hurts bad. Yeah. Um, peaks and valleys, Yeah. you know, when you're here, you're here. You know, and also, it's not so much always the fighting. It's sometimes dealing with the business of boxing. The business of boxing will take you, take you on a really low too. Dealing with certain promoters and matchmakers and things like that. So it's it's the whole business of a whole is is quite difficult and and mentally straining to deal with. Eddie, you and I were talking a little bit earlier because you have got Sky Nicholson in your gym at the moment. Obviously, she's a fledgling as far as the professional game is concerned. Yeah. Back home in Australia, she's a superstar. Yeah. And you're, you're starting, starting to see that now. You, you went with her to San Diego for a, a first um, pro fight. You met the family. Yeah. Did that really bring home the, the sort of responsibility to you that you've got as a trainer when you've got a, a young star like that on your hands? Yeah, um, I am, um, you know, I was just like talking to her one, one time and uh, I, I said to her, I said, um, you're, you're a bit famous at, over in Australia. And she said, a little bit. Um, do you get recognised when you go out, out outdoors and everything? She goes by a few people. She's so humble, but I re I'm getting to realise that she's this big superstar out in Australia. And sometimes when I lay down at night, I think to myself, you know, I've just got to keep her winning and make sure everything's right. And I've got to do my part uh, of the, you know, I do my part of the job because, you know, if, 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 if it all fails, you know, it, it all ends there. It's a big know? responsibility. Yeah, it's a though, massive so responsibility. Australia's yeah. going to come and kick yeah. your ass. No, no, <laughs> that's what I mean. I get people, point. That's what I mean. I get yeah. people messaging me all the time from Australia. Yeah. 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 Make sure yeah. you do right. I mean, you had the, the entire <laughs> yeah. city of Manchester behind yeah. you, but you've got the entire city of Leeds. And, and when it comes to responsibility, is it even bigger, do you think, because of the family connection, because he's your son? Um, We've always been pretty good at separating that father son connection. And I'm not, I'm not just saying it, but I mean, people say father son connection, they don't work, but they do. We've seen it time and time again, you know. Um, we're pretty good at separating that. Um, and we always have been. We don't bring boxing arguments into family, and we don't bring family arguments into boxing. And a classic example when it got stopped by a father. And they were laid on canvas, they kept him down as a precaution. And I've stood over him, and I've stood over him, I think, all right, pulling his houses up or something, because he'd slip. And I was looking, I thought, yeah, it's all right. And what bothered him most, wasn't the fact that he'd been stopped or he'd lost. He says, you weren't even bothered when I looked at that, Dad. You just stood <laughs> over me, like, looking at me. And I couldn't think of what to say. And the only thing I could come back with was, I've had worse than that on Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> So and that would be me and Sal. You must have been the coolest man in that yeah. arena that night, though, because everybody else that was watching fight, that fight, myself included, was thinking, Jesus, that looks bad. You know what that I felt like? Bad. I felt like putting Sal over my head and running away. <laughs> That's true. That, that is the truth, that. Because it's first time, of, first time of experience, that sort of thing. And we're learning all the time. None of us know everything, do we, as trainers, as fighters. We're all learning. i tell you what I don't remember, though. If I'm not mistaken, Louis Petit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure Eddie were in the other corner when one of my fighters lost to mm. Louis Petit and Eddie were in the corner. I remember that. Jamie Spade. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember? That was in Kent, wasn't it? Was yeah, it in Kent? He inflected me. My first loss as a professional leader, didn't we? That, yeah. that was, that was, that was well, a close yeah, fight. Yeah. Very close a good fight. fight. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad to see the two of you were able fight. to talk to each other in civilised terms at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know what? That, that was my first loss as a, uh, as a professional trainer, that one. Yeah. And you've never got over it? Never got over it. <laughs> <laughs> I've only just remembered it. I tell everyone I'm sat looking now, at him yeah. now thinking I remember him from somewhere. <laughs> anyway, yeah. That's well, what you what guys mean. can sort it out outside. <laughs> oh, no, no. He's so young. I want to move on because... I, I was talking to, to Eddie there about, about Sky, and obviously, Brian, your, your specialty, if you like, is the fact that you, you manage so many female fighters. Just tell us a, a little bit from your perspective about the explosion of women's boxing at the moment and, and just how 
it, it really has become such a, a phenomenon over the last three or four years. Yeah, it's amazing. So I started managing females when, like, 13 years ago before it was like the cool thing to do, yeah. you know, before every promoter, you know, wanted females on their card and stuff yeah. like that. So I've been in the struggle. Your job must have got a lot easier recently. Uh, recently, yeah. <laughs> I mean, thank God. And listen, this is not because I'm a match room. And yeah. all, but th Eddie, Eddie really, really helped women's boxing. Yeah. In the States, it was Lou DiBella. Yeah. Over here, it was definitely Eddie Hearn who brought women's boxing to a forefront. But, and I remember you know, 13 years ago, title fights, WBC title fights for $3,000. That's what they had to fight for. And you couldn't negotiate up. Otherwise, yeah, you're like, yeah. we don't need them on the card. Yeah, yeah. You know, so, you know, as compared to now where yeah. they're fighting for hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, and look, now you have uh, uh, Katie Taylor and Amanda Serrano headlined yeah, in Madison Square Garden. Yeah. It's the biggest fight in boxing, yeah. not just. Do you ever yeah. think we would ever see no. a fight like that? in an arena like that at this time. No, and you have to, you have to credit Eddie Hearn for that. You, you have to, and that's not me kissing his ass or anything like that, because you can go back to YouTube and see me and him had beef a few years ago. I, I remember it when you <laughs> came over with Christina Lina Darty yeah, uh, yeah. against Katie Taylor. Yeah. That was a bit of beef going on there. It was a little bit of beef. We, 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 we grilled it and ate it. We're good now. <laughs> we don't have no more beef. So, but no, you, you have to credit him because like, who would have thought? You, you have two females headlined in Madison Square Garden, the most famous arena in the world. You know, yeah. and you know, again, credit to him. But the explosion of women's boxing, again, you got it in, in the States, you credit Lou DiBella here, you definitely credit Eddie Hearn. And it's, and it's unbelievable uh, the way that the yeah. sport has evolved, actually, you know, and it's more mainstream. And you, you don't say, oh, it's a female boxing card. It's, it's, no. they're, they're boxers fighting on the card. So every you know card I mean? now, almost every card now has a female fighter on yeah. it. So it's just become the norm, hasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. What, what do you think it's down to in terms of, of changing? people's attitudes, particularly fans' attitudes, because obviously in the old days there were a lot of cavemen around who just you know, didn't, didn't want to get involved at all. Well, 100%. Now it's completely changed. There's still little pockets here and there, but... So again, I go back 13 years ago and the promoters would literally call you and tell you, listen, I want a female fighting on the card, but you can't look like a 13-year-old boy. And that's what they would tell you. But now it's all about marketability. Yeah. Um, these females, once you get them in the gym, and you could probably attest to this, once you get them in the gym, they work harder than guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, I literally, I took Ebony Bridges to New York, and she was training for the Shannon Courtney fight. She did 21 rounds straight, and I put five different females in with her. And I never yeah. seen a female work so hard. And you know, you see Ebony, you, f you see the fake yeah. breast, you see the lingerie. That girl. I've never noticed, right. to be honest. With you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a couple of drinks before the weigh-in. So, but 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 that girl has sacrificed more than than yeah. I've I've ever seen a male fighter sacrifice. So, um, yeah. Once you see these females work, do you feel in that sense though that, that in some cases because of that, a lot of the women are having to work harder to get the titles, to get the recognition, to get the money that they feel they, they deserve because it is still such a male-dominated world? No, because some of these females can actually fight. If you look at them, listen, you know, some of them have more testicular fortitude than the guys. They do, you know what I mean? I mean, look at Ebony's, I'm gonna go back to Ebony because I'm staring at her on the poster. Her eye when she fought Shannon Courtney. Yeah. She couldn't see. She came back to the corner. Yeah. She and said she, she couldn't see. The, the state of her hands after the fight in Leeds uh, last yeah. year. Yeah. Well, well, you know, yeah. nobody knows this, but she she, uh, she sprained her ankle in that fight. Yeah, she wasn't. She, she was banged she was up. Real. Yeah. 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 But that's but but that's one female. That's one case. And and all these other females work just as hard. I could go with to Jamie Mitchell. We, you know, which we yeah. talked about before. Wow. before the thing, the rough lives they have. All these females have a story, and that's kind of like what attracts me to the female game because either they can fight really good, they're marketable, or they have a story. Yeah. And that's why I kind of like, you know, that's, that's why I have 23 females. Yeah. I manage 23 females. I think, I think a huge part of how the, um, you know, the pandemic wasn't a great thing for anything other than a few things. And I think one thing that, you know, massively benefited through the pandemic was women's boxing. And again, yeah. it's not just me big and Eddie Earn up, but, mm -hmm. The fight camps, you know, the fight camp cars, yeah. it'd have women's, and they delivered. Do you know what I mean? You look, you know, you're Sasha Jonas, Terry Harper, um, was one that really stood out, was nominated for fight of the year. But oh, every yeah. show, every show had a women's fight on that mm -hmm. delivered. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was where people was like, at first it was like, hey, did you see that women's fight last night? And then it, it become almost weekly, every other week. And yeah. then it's just now become, not, it's just yeah. become accepted. When did you do did you ever find yourself when women's boxing were first kind of came on scene yeah. and introduced? 
if you sat at home watching it, you'd go put kettle on. You'd, yeah. and you, you I, I've been guilty serious. of that. And you won't take it serious. Now I find myself saying, "It's going to be a good fight." Yes, I want to get home and watch it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many bridges I'm going to go and watch mm -hmm. it? And then get a boring fight. I'm not no, no, guaranteed a good now, fight. Yeah. Now they're not there just to make numbers up like that. No way. And I think it's been a collective thing with promoters, trainers, and the fighters themselves all yeah. making it serious. And like you said there about um, putting themselves out there, putting the, some of these fighters are fantastic, aren't they? So, yeah. You know, so I, I'm one now that it's completely changed my opinion. Mm -hmm. Ebony Bridges opinion obviously fighting for a world changed. title this weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Very best of luck to her and Sky, obviously. Yeah. Their second pro fight. Moving it forward on to this weekend and, and Josh's rematch with, with Kiko Martinez. I'm interested in rematches as, as a phenomena in the sense that obviously a long time has passed. It's been five years since, since the first fight and, yeah. and, and the two of them have gone in in very different sorts of directions. But when you have a rematch and it's someone that you've got a good idea in terms of you know what to expect, and we always know what to expect from Kiko. Yeah, yeah. How differently do you prefer uh, uh, to prepare? How differently can you prepare in order to try and come up with a, a different kind of a game plan? Or do you think, right, well, the same game plan worked last time, let's do it again. What, what's different about a rematch? To be honest with you, I think with a rematch, what it does is it makes you look even even deeper into yourself and to your opponent. Um, first time round, we had a bit of a, an issue with his, his lead hand where he broke in at the end of the second or beginning of the third round. Essentially turned us into a one-handed fighter. He was still throwing it, but he couldn't throw it with any sort of venom. You know, he, um, no excuses because we won that fight. We don't need to make excuses. I think this time now, do you... Sorry, initially, I'll go back. Sorry, I'll go back there. Everybody said that we were fighting a wash up Kiko Martinez, and I said, No, no, yeah. we're not. That's because it's a bit first time he's not being given short notice. It's yeah. a bit first time he's not going to have to boil down in weight. He had a, something like a, a 12, 13 week camp, and he had a week's holiday in between, and he, he, he went out at featherweight. And he went absolutely relentless with Kiko. He kept coming and coming and coming. And we know that's what he's going to do. There's no Kiko Martinez can't box any other way. You'll never see Kiko boxing on back foot. Yeah. You'll never see him standing up and giving your shoulder rolls or backing into you know a corner. Gonna fight yeah. You know what you're going to get with Kiko. And that's going to be smack. He's going to be there in your face. How we handle it is another matter. Whether we hold his ground and we go with him. We don't know whether we agree. Box him at range. We, we don't we, we don't plan away. <laughs> well... No, well Listen, you know that, though. We all know about game plans and everything else. If they knew our game plan and we knew their game plan, being able to carry it out, something like uh -huh. that. You know, he might know, punch for punch, what we're going to throw, step by step, which way we're going to step, little half steps, little laybacks, little feints. Doing something about that is a different matter, you know. So we'll see how we that, go. That makes an interesting point. I mean, Eddie, for example, I mean, when, you, when you're getting a, a young fighter through to, to, to coming up to a, to a higher level. Um, when you're talking about game plans, yes, as, as Sean's just said, it's all right having a game plan. Do you have multiple plans in case the first one doesn't work? Do you have to make sure that you're prepared and make sure that they're prepared that, right, if this isn't working, we do this. If that isn't working, we do that. No, I wouldn't look, I, I don't think we, me and Al Smith in the gym, we don't look it too much into it. You look at a fighter and what, um, um, just the, the basic things they do, like, like they might be falling in after they throw a shot, just simple things. But the, the fighter should, should be able to adapt themselves, I think. And I like to work it out for what I do. I, I like to try and work it out on the night because like, you can prepare for something and when they come in, they're completely different. Like, like, like you watch them and they go on the back foot and you think, he's going to go on the back foot. And then as you go in there, all they do is push you back. Like, I, we've I, had that before. I do have a bit of a safety yeah. net now. I always have something alternative to yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. That, that will what I learned mm. from the first fight. Yeah. yeah. And that's only me personally. Yeah. I agree, oh, I agree yeah. with what you say with simple yeah. things. We, plan A, plan B. Yeah. 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 Boxes, we are lost on simple things. Yeah, we have like just an outline really. But I, I think most I know, of the time I know we work it out on the night, yeah. But I always because do now have yeah. a little bit of a safety. Yeah. I, I like to have 
uh, game plan, A, B, C, D, E, all the way to F. And if F, F is fuck it. We're fighting. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's what F is. And when I get to F, fuck it, you got to fight now. But, but so, me, it, yeah. But for me, that's what we do in the gym. We, we, we cover them points anyway, to learn to fight on the back foot, to, to learn to yeah. fight, uh, push them back, to learn to move your head. That should be all down the yeah. gym. So on the night, you should be able to do I it. I get that with a fight. Yeah, yeah. A fight has got to adapt. He's got yeah. to use his breed himself. At time. But I think that's the importance of having a good corner, Absolutely. you know, when you yeah. come back to that. And 100%. Then, yeah. Being told if things aren't going your way, because yeah. some fighters can be so stubborn. Some fighters can be unbelievably stubborn, yeah. so that's when it's down to a good coach, a good corner, saying, no, listen, you've got to change things up and getting them to carry out those things. Well, what do you see then, Brian, as, as the art of a good chat in the corner uh, during rounds, between rounds, rather, if you've only got, you know, 60 seconds to get very, very clear, concise I mean, provision. first off, when they get back to the corner, they're not going to hear anything you say. I like to give them maybe 10 seconds to let them breathe and get themselves together, yeah. you know? And then, once they're there, don't throw too much at them. Give them yeah. maybe two things two things, calm them down, calm the breathing down, give them two things that you see out there because, I, yeah, I mean, I, I agree yeah. with you. I, yeah. I understand what you're saying, yeah. but in the same note, you can't let a fighter go out there and think for themselves all the time because some, yeah. you have gym fighters and Anthony, you could probably yes. say this, yeah, and, you, and you, you as well. You have guys that look great in the gym and shitty oh, in the totally fight. Totally. Then you have guys that look shitty in the gym, great in the fight. So Some, some might need more help than others. A hundred percent. So, so you're, again, to your point, they, your corner, that's what the corner is there yeah, for. Yeah. You can't just say, okay, in the gym you fight on your back foot. No, in a fight, you, you have to have a game plan and you have to give them proper, proper instructions. Oh, no, the we have a game plan and then if, it, if it's not going to plan, then we would adjust it. We would adapt uh, accordingly. Definitely, yeah. I always, yeah. I always say as a coach, well, like even whether it be in the gym or even on the night, because you know that individual. I always say, some need a carrot, some need a stick. You go in too hard on some fighter in the gym, they're going to come apart a little bit. And even on fight night, I know you could say, well, this is you know, it's the hurt business or all that, but some, it's how you get those instructions across. And sometimes yeah. you've got to dress them up a little bit nicer. So certain fighters, where yeah. certain fighters, bang, they need him yeah. running down the yeah, road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, can, you can curse at some fighters. Yeah, you can, totally. But then some fighters don't react to that. Totally. So you have to talk, you have to talk to them in a different so tone. Carrot, yeah. Exactly. Is the I best think... case scenario then, Sean, that a fighter who, even though they've got a plan and even though they're talking to you and you're talking to them, the fighter that doesn't necessarily listen or take it in? Oh, nightmare. No, no, no. yeah. I've got a couple. And we know, we've, we've seen them. I've got a couple. I won't mention no names, Reese. Reese, <laughs> <Please, please. laughs> <laughs> but how do you deal yeah, with it? Is, how do you deal with it? It drives you fucking mad. Yeah. I mean, we've had an example. We've had an experience of this. And um, for eight rounds, I was asking Josh for one thing. So we've covered that one thing and we've got what we want. You can't move on. It's not just a case of do this, do that, and that next round, something different. You've got to get your base out right first. Then he can build on that base. Yeah. You can't ask him for number four until he's done number two or three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Uh, 100%. So I'm asking him for eight rounds, nine rounds, and I've done hard things to say. And I got in absolutely blazing mad with water. And all I could say to him was, do you want to go back to work on Monday fucking morning? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to be getting fun for yesterday at Gallic? Because that's where you're going if you don't fucking perform. And that's all I had to offer him because I'd asked for everything. Got nothing, we'd left it too late into the fight to start again. You know, like a fighter gets knocked down first round, second round, and say, right, that round's gone. This is your first round, here we go. And, es and essentially what you do is, if you're high energy and if it's a fighter that will accept yeah. your energy, it's kind of like an energy transfer. Yeah. You can, give you, you can give them your energy if they're that type of fighter. Yeah, right? that's right, yeah. 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 I agree with that. So, yeah, worst nightmare is a fighter that don't listen, but believe me, both my fighters and on, on, Saturday night, they'll be listening, all right. That works really well, because I'm going to spin things forward to this weekend. Eddie, obviously, you've got Sky uh, making her second professional yeah. appearance against Beck Connolly, who's, who's yeah. very experienced. Yeah. And, and she said in, in the press conference the other day, she feels like she's a bit of a, a gatekeeper in that sense. So yeah. what are you looking for from Sky this weekend? Um, we wouldn't, you want to wouldn't change too much of what she does good. But just to, to add, um, I'd like to, uh, to throw, we've been working on her to um, hold her, when, when she's um, work, work inside a little bit more, obviously she's not an inside fighter, but even to punch herself out, maybe a few, few more combinations, a little bit more spite in her punches, they're saying and doing it, but um, 
Just holding the feet a little bit more. Yeah, a little, yeah, a little bit at more. Same, yeah. Down on the punches. At times. Yeah, yeah, at times. Yeah, because she's a nice uh, boxer. She's never going yeah, to you, you don't want to yeah. take away what she's good at, just to add. And, and, I say, and we say, like, in the long run, in the long term, you're going to be, they're going to try to, they ain't going to be able to have a boxer. They're going to try to drag her into a tear up and rough her up. So she has to know, be able to know how to handle herself. So she's a work in progress. Good steady development. That's what we want. Absolutely. Uh, as far as you're concerned, Brian Ebony, of course. I mean, she's fighting for a world title. Yeah. This, as she said, this literally is a fight that could change her life. It is, it is. And like she said, it would be a great chapter to her book. You know, uh, she moved all the way here from Australia, dropped everything in Australia, and she lives here now, you know. Um, she trained with Mark Tibbs for this fight. Uh, you know, uh, great trainer, great man. Um, I, I think she's going to do really well. As long as she follows instructions, and there's one thing about Ebony, she's a sponge. So whatever you tell her, good, bad, or indifferent, she's going to go out there and do. So it's going to be an interesting fight. The girl is a veteran. Uh, Ebony only has, what, seven fights, eight fights. It's going to be a good fight. Anthony, you've got the luxury of, of watching this weekend and, yeah. and enjoying yourself. What, what are you looking forward to the most about this? this um, so, I mean, obviously, the main event is, uh, as you just screams excitement. I think the atmosphere is going to be something else. Um, and not just because I'm going to sat next to Sean. I, I really <laughs> do believe it'll be a big performance from Josh. But listen, look right through the card. Um, I think Maxi and Ryan are just two honest pros. You stuck with it. And listen, the winner is not far off. Well, I'm not speaking out of turn here. You know, Max has got the IBO world title, but there's the light was a very hot division, but the winner of that, you know, is next in line, a potential huge fight. Um, you, you can go right through the card, and, but it's a great fight. But obviously, listen, it's, it's hard to look past the main event. Do you see a, a few parallels in terms of Max's career compared with, with how... A Back little bit, yeah. Away. Yeah, mine was um, a roller coaster, to say the very least, and I believe Max is more so to the extreme. I think his story is more incredible because of the fact that he, he very nearly walked away, very nearly, whereas I, I didn't walk away, but there were some dark times where I think Max was you know, that far away from walking away, and it's good that he stuck with it, and he's had these big nights, he deserves these big nights. Sean, I'll finish with you. Obviously, we've spoken about Maxi quite a bit there, but... Josh looks in fantastic shape. He looks like, I mean, obviously after the, yeah. the second Lara fight at uh, Headingley, he was absolutely crestfallen, but he looks like he's really got his mojo back. I think he has. I mean, after the first fight with Lara, obviously flat. No, uh, I won't make any excuses, but I could give you half a dozen reasons. We won't go into that now. I think for him, mental thing was well, accepting rematch with Lara. And you'll get people saying that, yeah, same thing was going to happen. But from where I was standing and where Josh was standing, he took Lara's best shots in first two rounds, never moved him. And I think personally, we were on top in that fight. Lara was complaining to definitely after 30 seconds. He didn't want to be in there. There were nice little short punches coming underneath. There were nice little right hands coming on top when he were coming in. And for me, if the fight hadn't been stopped with that cut, we'd have answered all his questions, yeah. Um, I think Saturday night, this is going to be like turning the clock back to when we boxed Lee Selby, Cal Frampton. And I'm predicting, uh, for, I'm predicting a toenail win, to be mm. honest with you, Max Eels and Josh. Uh, we'll go for a toenail win. We wish you the very is best. All right? Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, well, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much indeed uh, for speaking to us. Thanks very much, Eddie. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks so much, Anthony. And thank you very much, Sean. And very, very, very best of luck for you on Saturday. Thank you very much. Guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, it's been fascinating. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us here on From the Corner. We'll see you again next time.